Coming up next on Art Rocks, a Louisiana native with a tenor voice that rings out worldwide. A lifelong traveler molding stories into art. Gravity defying sculpture. And the tender art of keeping bees. That's right, bees. That's all about to happen on Art Rocks. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello, welcome to Art Rocks with me, James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads Magazine. Allow me to introduce an operatic tenor who is not just a fixture in the great opera houses of the world, but also a tremendous source of pride in his native Lake Charles. After growing up in southwest Louisiana, Paul Groves first came to LSU, then went on to a career that has taken him to all the corners of the world. Here's Paul to tell us a little about his journey. Oh, From the French-speaking bayou country of southwest Louisiana to the renowned stages of the world's leading opera houses, American tenor Paul Groves has graced audiences with an array of stellar performances. A gifted musician, Groves recognizes his family's influences on his impressive career. My whole family did music. My dad was head of the music department at McNeese State University in Lake Charles, Louisiana for many, many years. He's also the choral director. And my mother's, she was a, a public school teacher, but her whole family was involved in music. The Groves Gospel Quartet, my grandfather was in that. And my father actually, as a child, played the piano for them. So at family reunions on both sides, we, you know, we got together and sat around the piano and sang gospel songs. And we, I always did music. Now, I, I never imagined I would be a professional opera singer. But I knew I would do something in the music field. Following a brief stay at his local university, Groves realized he would like to be a singer. They say that timing is everything, and for Paul, a move to Louisiana State University proved to be a matter of extremely good timing. Robert Grayson, the great teacher from LSU, and also the Metropolitan Opera soprano Martina Arroyo, they both came to teach at LSU in the same year that I arrived. So. They really, both of them took me under their wing and uh, I got a lot of inspiration from them and also a lot of practical knowledge about what it was like to be a traveling opera singer and I also got a lot of knowledge about if I was good enough to have a career because it's, it's very difficult to, as a young singer, to know if you have the talent. In the course of our first year of work together, I, I could see that there was something there and as we moved forward and he gained discipline, it was quite clear that he was going to be successful. He always fulfilled whatever was put in front of him, and again, without all the stress and drama that many people have. It wasn't long before Groves began winning competitions in the area, and although those successes here and there were gratifying, he knew it was time for another move, a move that would propel him to the world stage. I decided uh, no one was going to discover me, you know, and, and Metropolitan Opera was not going to discover me in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, so I went to Juilliard. I got into the Juilliard Opera program, and from there I only stayed one year, and I, I won the Metropolitan Opera competition that year, and I went straight into the Metropolitan Opera the next year. So from the time I left Baton Rouge to go to New York, I made my Metropolitan Opera debut 14 months later. He knew what he was after, and he could focus on that goal. And along the way, he learned what things, in terms of lifestyle that led up to performances, facilitated him doing his best work. And he's just been successful year after year. From that 1992 debut at the Met, Groves continued as a premier leading tenor, debuting at Italy's La Scala in 1995, and on to the Paris Opera, London's Royal Opera, the Lyon, Vienna, and Frankfurt operas. There is probably not a male singer who has better control over his instrument. He can essentially 
do anything he wants on virtually any day. He sings as if he was 20 years younger. He has all the facility. And yet then he has all this 25 years of high profile experience and artistry that he brings to his work. It's an honor to be able to sing these operas and sing in somebody else's language for them. And I work really hard so that you know my American accent does not show. I've sung in every major opera company and I've sung you know, the leading tenor role in every major opera. The place I enjoy the most is the Metropolitan Opera. I consider it the world's greatest opera company. It's, we do beautiful productions and I was there as a young artist so I know everyone in the house so it's like going back to school for me when I go back. And next year will be my 29th season at the Metropolitan Opera. He's a wonderful thinking artist with a lot of intellectual curiosity. Uh, which I love. He's always thinking about what the words mean and how to color the words and uh, how, to, how to tell the story, which is important for an opera singer. He has great qualities. You know, what, even when I go to the operas these days, I get excited about it. It's, it's the art form that I, I've had the most goosebumps. Not, in, not only on stage performing, but just viewing. When I first got to New York City, I would go to almost every night to the Metropolitan Opera and stand way up at the top at the standing room, because that's the only tickets I could afford. And I was just thrilled every night by just the sound of the unamplified human voice. Just, you know, there's something that every once in a while, it's just magic that you just, you don't get, I feel, in a lot of other art forms. Operatic tenor Paul Groves, top solist of vocalists, sought by the world's greatest opera houses. And although he has lost count of the hundreds of roles and venues he has performed, he has never lost his sense of place and home. Louisiana was always home. I lived in New York for 25 years and in Europe and everywhere, but Louisiana is, is always home. You know, it's, it's hard to get the Louisiana out of, out of all of us, but one of the reasons I moved back is just for the fishing. I go fishing all the... When I'm home, I go two or three times a week. I love it. I've loved it since I was a kid. and. It's the one thing, one activity that I'm, I never lose the passion for. And I love singing, I love entertaining, so I'm, I'm going to do it for as long as I can possibly do it. Want to get out of the house and get to grips with some serious art this weekend? Here are some of our picks for notable exhibits coming soon to museums and galleries near you. For more about these and many more events in the arts, subscribe to Arts Monthly, the new free e-newsletter from the editors at LPB and Country Roads magazine. What's more, the Art Rocks website features every episode of this program, so to see or share any episode again, log on to lpb.org and navigate to Art Rocks. For Wisconsin-born Christina Carfora, her creative muse is her lifelong love of travel. Carfora combines photography and sketches made during her wide-ranging adventures to make works that reveal startling glimpses of the world out there. One of the big inspirations behind my work is my travels. I've been to 23 countries. I've been working very realistically and life-size. We see someone we identify, we relate to them, and we hopefully are not just looking at you know what they're made out of, but actually 
their expression on their face. And so I'm using those clues and those identifiable, comfortable sorts of imagery to bring you into the narrative right away. My name is Christina Carfora. I'm a sculptural ceramics artist with a passion for drawing. Normally, the work starts from a real story, from a real person I met, from a real event, or something I actually experienced. A lot of times, it's just a moment or something that happens that flickers and I see something there. I do keep a sketchbook when I travel. I do a lot of photography as well. And so sometimes the beginning of a piece I don't always see right away, but it's captured in a photograph. They're memories, and so how can you express that through this sort of dreamlike quality? When I went one time in Kalimantan to a rescue, I met a female orangutan there who had her hand chopped off from an oil the palm oil plantations. She was emaciated, starving, and she had been caught for quote unquote stealing from the palm oil plantation. So that piece, the orangutan, she has this mechanical hand that I created. She has like 300 different parts and I created all of the rivets and everything else, but I really wanted to spend a lot of time with this very harsh human element that I purposely made not functional for her. She can't use it, but it's a reminder always of this relationship, and it can be beautiful and it can be ugly. The relationship between humans and how we're impacting the world and our environment. Normally with this, I actually put my own fingernail under their fingernails to make it convincing. So it's just like a real subtle. The hands, they actually represent the passenger pigeon. The passenger pigeon became extinct in 1914. Within only a few short decades, they went from over nine billion of these birds that flew in these flocks across the country, so dense that they actually would block out the sun. There were so many of them. They're beautiful, but they can also be destructive. The lace represents a time past. So I want to bring it to contemporary context and have us think about other issues. And so when they're installed, the shadows are actually the absence of the passenger pigeon. They're where the light is not. I really enjoy, and I think that's part of why I travel as well, is when I leave the realm of reality, when I re enter the impossible, and, and then starting to figure out how to communicate those sorts of ideas but I don't want to give you the whole answer. People can bring something of their own to the work and then take away a new idea or a story or a desire to travel somewhere, whether it be an actual location or something in their head. There's many different ways of traveling. The next time you're in Houston, Texas, leave time to check out the cloud column sculpture that was recently installed at that city's Museum of Fine Arts. While the artwork is a sight to behold, so too is the story of its strange journey to the south. Well, today is a really exciting and important day in the history of our museum and, and I hope in the history of the city. We're installing this extraordinary work by the British and Indian artist Anish Kapoor, Cloud Column, here at the Brown Foundation Plaza. The sculpture has arrived and it comes in its big metal frame. It actually came on a ship from, from England about a year ago and we've had it in storage. For the last week or so, artisans from Anish Kapoor studio have been polishing it and cleaning it inside of its cage, its support system. We have uh, 80 uh, art installing staff. Uh, we travel all over the world. We ship uh, a range of customs clearance, logistics, uh, installation. It's a full turnkey service from fabrication, construction, um, shipping, everything you can need to move a work of art from A to B anywhere in the world. We fabricated a steel travel frame that encompassed the entire sculpture in the vertical and we shipped it from London down to uh, the port of Southampton in the UK and into Galveston. Um, we had a trucking company pick it up in Galveston and take it to the storage of the museum 
about a year ago where it's that uh, brave in the uh, hurricane that came last year and uh, then we uh, came on site. It's been a long time coming. This is a, an exciting, very exciting moment for the museum. It, currently it's horizontal. It's in its travel frame uh, sideways on a large flatbed truck. It's going to be lifted and set on the ground and then inverted upright so that it's in its correct position. We change all the strapping and the rigging around and then we pick it up in that correct orientation and then it flies over to the spot right behind me. That's a lot of stainless steel and it's a lot of organizing and getting the ground ready for it, the plinth that it gets attached to, getting the cranes uh, uh, ordered and the right size crane because we have to fly this thing through the air. We've got to go over a building and set it down and uh, that part of it will uh, is that's the fun part. That's the, that's the, the glamour shot but it's quick. <laughs> you don't want it in the air very long. When the stoke was lifted over the actual steel foundation plate, uh, we had a large galvanized steel plate fixed on a cruciform that goes down into a structural steel pile into the ground to support the sculpture. The first thing to do is get that item secure. So we want to get some bolts in the holes, get some nuts on them, then we know we're safe. So it's a real um, important time for everyone to be totally focused on the connection between those two interface plates. This had a lot of planning ahead of it. As you can imagine, you're not going to move this around a whole while. It's going to go to one spot, you're going to pull it down, that's it. But all of that had to be pre-planned. Uh, we actually made a very large, full-scale mock head of it uh, just so we could see and, and grasp and determine where the best place is for it. So we work with the Nisha Force studio uh, very closely. He looks into where it's positioned, how it's positioned, and even you know when it's viewed on certain days. You have to install it in its raw state and then you have to build a scaffold around it to polish it. During the construction, um, we rinse with the ionized water, sometimes on a weekly basis. But, you know, we don't want to actually touch the artwork. It's mainly just a rinse. The polishing is an industrial process taken to the nth degree. Trying to get that deep mirror image. What is distinctive about Cloud Column and what really makes it appealing to me is that it's hand hammered. It has this marvelous, not rippled, but wavy surface applied by the artist, which breaks up the reflection into almost like a bee's eye or an insect's eyes into multiple reflections. And you're consciously, you're always conscious of the hand of the artist. It's a very human piece, very human in its scale. It relates to the human figure standing and uh, it invites you to participate with it. You can walk around it and you see yourself and the surroundings reflected in different ways. Facing north, this concave interior grabs the heavens and brings them down to earth. It's a true exclamation point for the plaza and I know this is, will instantly will be a hub for all things cultural here in Houston. Honey Run Farm is a small family-run operation near Williamsport, Ohio that makes the most out of a range of bee byproducts. What began as a hobby has evolved into a successful business and a way of life. Let's lift the lid a little to see, if you'll pardon the expression, what all the buzz is about. Look at that. That makes me a happy beekeeper. So uh, the main thing we do is produce honey. I'm going to pull this frame out. I think this is solid honey. Yeah, this is all honey here. Here you can see a little pollen. That yellow stuff, that orange stuff is goldenrod pollen. And that's their protein. The honey is their carbohydrate. This is good, good to see because this means they're going to make it through the winter. Well, <laughs> Jane and I work at Honey Run. <laughs> 
It's a small family business. We have four kids. Um, they're all six and under. Growing up, I was always around my parents working together on the farm and I think that helped influence my choice to be wanting to be on a farm so that my kids could be around me, see what we do, help out. And my wife was in there. Uh, after college, I uh, met Jane and she says that I mentioned to her that I wanted to keep bees and I don't even remember that, but um, she for Christmas got me a, a beehive. Yeah, so I put it together and started reading about it and got interested in that first summer, uh, we ended up having two hives. And this didn't really become a business until about 2008 or 9. we started selling the honey at farmer's market. Eventually we were up to like 150 to 200 hives and in 2011 I quit teaching and this is what we've been doing since. It's been a slow process but we're up to near 400 hives now and I, I'm hoping we'll be up in the 500 range next year. This is the brood chamber where the queen and the, and the brood are going to make it through the winter. The excluder is called a queen excluder. It's shaped basically to where the bees uh, can come up but the queen is too big to get up through there. And that prevents her from laying eggs and having a brood nest up in these top chambers. These top chambers are called honey supers and you know you hope that the bees fill it up with honey and that's what we'll harvest here today. Oh that looks great too you know. This is chock full of honey. The bees have got this honey you know pulled out as far as they can and it's goldenrod honey. In the summer it's a different color it's uh, more white and uh, uh, if it's got a strong clover flow it's like snow white but this is more yellow and it's goldenrod honey. We pull honey spring, summer, fall, and as the flowers change, you have a different taste in the honey. In the bottle of fall, it's a little darker look, and that's just the honey looks darker, and it's mostly from the goldenrod. The bees are foraging on goldenrod, and then the aster comes on, and the taste of that honey is going to be way different from the summer. Uh, it has a more rich, butterscotchy taste. Um, and that's just because the nectar of the goldenrod is different than the nectar of, say, clover in June. You know, the bees are collecting honey for them. It's not for us. And so they, they have all these carbohydrates ready for winter. And in our case, if we steal the fall honey from them, which they need, we've got to supplement it with something. I robbed them of their good box of honey on top. So you uh, supplement it with feed for one. If it's warm enough, liquid feed works fine. This stuff is a, a mixture of sugar and water and um, basically a, a lemongrass uh, and minty essential oils. It's, it's good for the bees going into winter. This is a protein patty. These are protein sugar mix and um, and I'll put that in the brood chamber for them to eat. I've fed them a lot of protein this summer. The bees look better than I've ever seen. So that box alone weighs a good 50 or 60 pounds. And they're still pulling in goldenrod and aster honey. So I'm, I'm not in much danger of starvation here, but I'm going to give them a, a box of food anyway. We really can't separate home from work. It's all enmeshed together. The honey is all bottled and processed in the honey house, which is just a couple steps out the back door. Bees, bees everywhere. And that's our, our man Leif out there. He does a great job. Uh, he'll pull frames of honey out and run it through what's called an uncapper. And the uncapper takes the wax capping that the bees have put on there, takes it off. And that goes on a whole nother route um, and becomes you know, candles eventually. But the honey frames, got these frames of honey, they go into the extractor. And it's just a big centrifuge. It spins them round and round, and the honey spins out. The honey, it goes into a settling tank. You know, starting out, um, I, I didn't realize how important a settling tank was, and it's really important. Uh, the honey sits in there for a day or two, and 
the the stuff. It's called slum gum, beekeeper lingo. It, it rises to the top, and it's just this uh, all waxy air bubbles. It's this layer that rises to the top of the settling tank, and the honey is then bucketed up out of the bottom of the settling tank, and that makes for a nice, pure, golden honey. And at that point, we can we can pump it up into our bottling tanks. I grew up in a Mennonite house, and so everything, uh, we did a lot of making things from scratch, keeping things very simple. The, the products from the honeybee really are amazing because they all get used. So the honey can be extracted, whatever is excess honey that the bees don't need, we can take, it can be used to eat, but also put into soap and lip balms and things like that. Um, and then the beeswax, which is used as we scrape that from the, the comb, we can clean that, render it down, it can be used as a candle, put in the soap, put in the beeswax lip balms. Um, so really, there's no hive product that is thrown out. It's all reused. I plan on building hives until it kills me. I, I love this job. So. Well, that's that for this edition of Art Rocks. But remember, to find or share any episode again, just visit lpb.org slash artrocks. And if you want more reasons to explore our great state, Country Roads magazine makes a great resource for learning what's going on in arts and culture all across the state. So until next week, I'm James Fox Smith, and thank you for watching.